Hey everybody, welcome to Comics with Bueller. As always, I'm Bueller. Today is episode 66 of the new Coffee and Comics show. As you can see, I'm not alone. I got my good friend Bob. Bob, how are you? I'm doing well this morning. How about yourself? I'm doing all right. It's early when we're filming this on mm -hmm. a Sunday morning, and this comes out even earlier on a Monday morning. That's exactly right. I'll be up tomorrow, will you? I'm, all, <laughs> I'm always up when this premieres on Monday morning. Know, I'm in the chat, so there you go. Uh, I want to let you guys know we will leave a timestamp to where we start our discussion about our topic today. It'll be down in the description below, so if you want to jump to that, you can. But we got a lot of great things to cover before we get to the actual uh, conversation we're going to have. Mm -hmm. But we always start off with the coffee that we're drinking today. Mm -hmm. And we're drinking coffee from Mocha Express, which is the official coffee shop of Comics with Bueller. And today I'm drinking, again, a hazelnut latte. Mm -hmm. uh, they are out of eggnog now, officially. They did get more back in, and then I drank it all. And now I'm back to this. What are you drinking today? I am doing the, uh, drinking the same thing I drank last week, which is a four-shot Americano with some cinnamon brewed inside of it and some sugar-free vanilla sweetener. It's really good. You heard it here first, folks. He said he's drunk right now. There you go. <laughs> I've been accused of worse things. That's all right. That's all right. <laughs> My coffee's really good. Even though it's not the eggnog, it's okay. Um, but let me first go ahead and jump into some uh, kind of some housekeeping real quick. Um, I want to let everyone know, and I wasn't planning on telling any, anyone this. I set it up last week. I now have a Patreon account. Yeah. And I, I actually wasn't going to tell anyone about it until, like, my two-year anniversary, which comes up next month. Mm -hmm. But somebody already found it. <laughs> <laughs> and somebody has already signed up for my Patreon. And uh, Mike Rogers is my first Patreon member on my Patreon account. Uh, thank you, Mike. That's awesome. <laughs> I don't have anything on there. It's just that's kind of blank. But Mike did a little bit of research and he found it, and he is my first Patreon. Um, as I get closer to my two-year anniversary, mm -hmm. I'll talk about it more. Um, but I I do have a Patreon. I do have my first member, and uh, thank you, Mike, very much. So that's awesome stuff. Yeah. So I was a little surprised when I saw a name <laughs> pop up because I I hadn't told anybody about it. So. Just goes to show you can't do anything anymore that's somebody knowing. That's it. That's how it works. <laughs> um, I also want to let people know I have some Bueller boxes available right now. Um, I got a bunch of brand new books, like newer books that just came out. You can see right here is X-Men number one. I got a ton of books like this, like books within the last couple months that are going into the Bueller boxes right now. They're a little bit more in price. They're like $14 because it's costing me a little bit more. But there's 11 books and a lot of really great stuff. There's like multiple number ones in each box and a variant. There's only like a dozen uh, boxes available, not that many. Uh, but a lot of new books you'll find. X-Men books, House of X, Power of X, Excalibur, Wolverine, all sorts of good stuff that's in there. I got a really good deal, so I'm excited to have those on. Um, I do have my horrible comic shop story I forgot to tell it last week <laughs> I will tell that at the end of the video when we get uh, to the uh, after the topic uh, I'm looking forward to sharing that one he already knows what I it do, is I so do I do that's a great story it's, it's terrible a terrible story but a great story it's a terrible horrible story <laughs> <Yes>. yeah. <laughs> yeah so let's go ahead and start our first five we'll go ahead and get to it right now but uh, Bob I'll let you go first what we do we show five comics mm -hmm. and at the end we show our final five Bob, you're up. You got your first five. Go ahead. And actually, um, actually, I'm going to do six. Six is good. There you go. Because uh, yesterday we went to the uh, Image event where the executives were all there at I Like Comics in Vancouver. It was an amazing time. And uh, we got six comics uh, signed by these uh, incredible uh, uh, creators. And so the first one is Guardians of the Galaxy 25. I got that one signed by Jim Valentino. Nice. Which is awesome. Then I got Amazing Spider-Man number 332. And I got this one signed by Eric Larson. I had them all personalize them to me because signatures on books that are not graded, they're not worth as much. But yeah. they mean something to me, so I had them personalized. Uh, this is Wolverine number 155. And um, that one was signed by Eric Stevenson. I've always loved that cover. Nice. And then I got uh, the variant cover for Walking Dead number 19, the first appearance of Michonne, signed by Robert Kirkman. And then... Out of all the Spawn covers, I picked this one because I thought it had a good signing space, and it's one of my favorite covers. I got this one signed by the legend himself, Todd McFarlane. 
And then this one has a little more meaning to me. Uh, this picture always reminded me to never stay down, no matter how dark it is, to get back up. And it was done by Mark Silvestri, and he personalized it to me, and it says, For Bob, never stay down, Mark Silvestri. So That's there it awesome. is, folks. There's my, my first six. Let me see your six, man. That's really good. I, <laughs> before I show my first six, I want to show this. because Oh, yeah. We all got this. This is a poster that's signed by all six of the creators. We got McFarlane, Kirkman, uh, uh, Stevenson. Stevenson, Silvestri, Valentino. Uh, what's the other guy? Larson. Larson. There you mm -hmm. go. All signed. Very cool. They signed this poster for everyone that was there. There's like eight or 900 people showed up at this event. And everyone got this, so that's pretty cool. Bob's got one, I yeah. got one. It was awesome stuff. But wanted to show that thing first off. Okay, let me show my <laughs> lovely books. You might have to help me with the names because my brain's kind of fried. Cyberforce. Cyberforce. Mm -hmm. Who's this? That's Mark Silvestri. Mark Silvestri. There you go. Sign right there. Uh, next one is uh, Eric Larson. This one's autographed right there, kind of in the middle. He liked that cover a lot. Uh, this one is Stevenson, correct? That's Stevenson, yeah. Stevenson, Blood Strike. I like that one as well. All minor image books. It was an image thing. I didn't want to insult them. Ah, thank you. <laughs> uh, the next one is Valentino, Shadowhawk. That's kind of cool. Mm -hmm. And then Robert Kirkman had this one, The Walking Dead, 192. That's autographed. And then uh, another autograph from him was Oblivion Song, number one, also the autograph. Now, as you can see, I'm missing one. Mm -hmm. uh, the the big gun, Tom That's McFarlane. Right, Tom McFarlane. What's going on there? So I wanted to show what Tom McFarlane signed on mine, and I'll probably show a, a close-up picture of this. But this is my high school yearbook, and Tom McFarlane signed my yearbook because there is a history with him and I mm -hmm. from uh, way back in the 90s. So uh, he signed that book. Like I said, I'll probably put a picture on the screen so you can see it better. But uh, that's the autograph I got from him, mm -hmm. and it was a blast. I mean, uh, me and him talked for a little bit, a couple times. Uh, he actually uh, asked to take a selfie with me, and he sent it to his wife. That was awesome. Which is really cool. <laughs> um, he was texting his wife and calling his wife because she was my teacher in high school, and yeah. He took a picture of my yearbook photo. Which was cool. And sent it to her. <laughs> he took a picture of her photo and sent it to her. Mm -hmm. And uh, we hit it off really well. So it was uh, everything I could expect it to be, you know. And I was uh, very happy to sit there and talk with uh, Tom McFarlane. And hopefully um, he gets back to me because he has my information. He has my card and my email and everything. And he said that they're going to be trying to do more YouTube stuff. Sure. And uh, hopefully he will be a guest on the show. Obviously, I have a little bit of an in with him, and hopefully that pans out. So uh, There you go. Ho hopefully, Miss McFarlane doesn't remember me as that horrible student. <laughs> I was. So, oh, he was a good student. So, uh, mm -hmm. yeah, you should go spend some time with him. But awesome day. Yeah, absolutely. And not many people can say that they've had their yearbook signed by Todd McFarlane, except people who probably went to high school with them. So That's that right. right there is a gem. Yeah, so <laughs> this is this is definitely a keeper. This will not be on eBay or nothing like that. So <laughs> it's pretty awesome. All right, let's go ahead and get to our topic today. Yeah. And our topic that we asked, and we asked this question during our previews video that comes out on Wednesday, and we asked this last Wednesday. And the question was, do you think the market, the comic book industry, is headed for a crash? Whether it be similar to the crash in the 90s or something a little bit different. And all these uh, responses that we have, the comments that were left below, that's what we're going to read and that's what's going to drive this conversation. A lot of different views, a lot of different thoughts, and uh, some very passionate people about this subject. Mm -hmm. And honestly, most of the subjects that we cover, a lot of people have some strong opinions on and this one is no different. Yeah. So anyway, Bob, you are up first. You get the first question on if there is going to be a comic book crash. Absolutely. And I just put my cards on the table. I got a different take on this. Uh. And hopefully we can get to that. But uh, this is not about me. It's about you guys. So, <laughs> <laughs> All right. So this first uh, comment comes from Ben DeShane. I think that's your name. I don't hope I didn't butcher it. Uh, but he says, based on sales data, I don't think the overall comic book market is headed for a crash, but there is a worrisome part of the market. I think people paying inflated prices for graded modern is an area for concern. The difference in quantity, or excuse me, the difference in quality between a 9.8 and a 9.6 is small, and yet people pay two times the price for a 
I can see prices for modern 9.8 comics potentially falling sharply. Interesting comment. What do you think about that? Um, everyone kind of knows I'm not really a grading guy. I don't mm -hmm. really have any grading books. I only have three books that are graded, and those are actually gifts from people in the community that sent me. Um, so I really, personally, I don't really pay attention to the prices on those. Um, I do think that uh, the difference between the 9.6 and 9.8 is really the, the person who grades it that day. Yeah. I've heard that quite Sometimes, a bit. Yeah. I, I've never had one graded, so I really don't know. But that's kind of what I, what I hear. I don't think that there would be any uh, crash as far as graded books because I think that um, that's, the grading is something we didn't have before. When you look back in the 1990s, and that's the crash that everyone kind of talks about, right. grading services really weren't there. Uh, so this this would be a whole new ball of wax if this happened. Mm -hmm. And I really don't see it because historically when there is stuff that's graded, that's professionally graded, it tends to hold its value. Sure. And I'm not talking about just comics. I'm talking about coins or whatever or a card or any anything that's collectible tends to hold its value when it is graded. Now, it costs some money to get that done, mm -hmm. you know, obviously, and a lot of people are having it done. And uh, actually, that might be a good topic for us down the road sure. to grade or not to grade. So that's a great um, one. I think I thought about that the other day. That you might did. be the you one. Did. <laughs> but anyway, that's kind of my thoughts on that. I wish I could contribute more, but honestly, when people ask me about CGC stuff or graded stuff, I I, I got to tip my hat because I just don't know uh, that much about it. I know that you do. So I do. I'd like I to do. Hear your thoughts? Yeah. Well, I mean, really, when we're talking about, I mean, this subject, you know, is the comic book market headed for a crash? When I think of a crash, I'm thinking of the publishers going bankrupt. That's mm -hmm. a crash. When you talk, when you talk about DC or Marvel, uh, you know, potentially going out of business, uh, or you know, that would hurt the market. Uh, for graded books, uh, that that's on the collector yeah. themselves. And uh, you know, the difference between somebody collecting floppy, somebody collecting you know back issues, and somebody getting books graded, whether they be variants or older issues. That's on the collector, and I think, you know, I, I, I don't see a correlation of, I mean, yet I think graded books could go down in price, uh, you know, be, because, of, you know, they're so high in these newer books, you know, like he says, between a 9.6 and a 9.8, yeah. but I don't necessarily think that that would cause a market crash. I think just those value of those books would go down, but the actual comic book market itself hmm. would stay intact. So that's my thought on that one, and um, but really... You know, he talks about that there is a worrisome part of the market. He says it's it's based on grading. Uh, I think there is a worrisome part of the market, but we'll, we'll get into that in a little bit. Nice. Yeah, eventually maybe I'll get into the graded books. It just just has not happened yet. Sure, sure. So, I don't know. Uh, I got this next one, and this is from CLRG Comics Plus. Thank you so much. Yes, we are headed towards another crash. It's very obvious in my opinion since they make so many covers, especially Marvel, and it leaves the stores at a choice of don't want to get them all. Most of the time, they get too many and not sell them. So I also think the companies are selling the books for too much, which also can make less sales, which ties in with my first thought. So I wanted to read this guy's comment, and I'll tell you why. Okay. This is a kid. Mm -hmm. who put this out. I, I know who this is. He's, oh. he's a younger kid who didn't experience the crash that we did in the 90s. Sure. And he's saying this right now. I mean, he's, I think, in his lower teens, to be honest with you. Mm -hmm. um, and this is what he's saying. What do you think about that generation having that opinion on the comics? I, well, I, I think it's very mature, you know, being able to key into what's going on. Uh, you know, for him to be able to see his local comic shop, you know, you know, have to choose between, you know, buying all these books and not... And then noticing that they're still on the shelf a few weeks later, yeah. that's that's pretty you know d dialed in. Uh, and so I you know uh, CLRG Comics Plus, more power to you, man. Yeah. I, that's that's pretty that's pretty awesome. Uh, you know, and, and I do think it does put the uh, local you know the LCSs at a disadvantage uh, in when they're buying these books. But I'm still not so sure that the variance is what is actually going to cause a crash. Yeah. I mean, because that's what a lot of people are keying into is it's the variance. Yeah. Uh, I think there's much more involved here than just that. Yeah. I, I like this comment. Like I said, he's a younger kid. And uh, this actually lends me to the fact that I don't think there's going to be a crash. Mm -hmm. When I was this kid's age mm -hmm. and I was buying comics, mm -hmm. I wasn't thinking at all there might be a crash. Mm -mm. This just goes to show you the education level that most collectors have now 
that we didn't have back then. Absolutely. We didn't have the internet back then. Yeah. So I think, uh, even though he says he thinks there is a crash, I think he proves a point that he's self-aware of what's going on at such a, such a young age. Yeah. And I think that protects us from a crash. That's a great point. Yeah. You know, I mean, I didn't even think about that aspect of it. Uh, you know, being able to be, di- you know, back in the 90s, you know, with the whole uh, speculator market because of collecting at the time, uh, that is, you know, and then, of course, there was an inflated time because of superstars. Yeah. Uh, that caused that whole thing. Nowadays, he's exact, you're exactly right. People are much more dialed in, and the younger generation being dialed in, that gives me some hope. Yeah, I like, I like that one a lot. I was happy to read that one. For sure. You're up, Bob. You got the next one. Sure. This next one comes from Andrew Deutzman, or Deutzman. I think that's how you say it. If I butchered it, I'm sorry. <laughs> but thank you very much for the comment. He says, I don't think we're headed for a crash. Most people who speculate on books are readers and are part of the community. Even though there is a spec cycle, normally books that aren't worth the hype crash back down. While not a crash, I see a fender bender happening. It's kind of kind of a cool way to put it. By that, I mean last year was the first up year for comics in several years. Much of this due to the variant comic market. And these books, long-term success, are un- is, is unpredictable. To me, a 1 in 10 and a 1 in 25 variant means nothing to me. If I'm looking for the issue, it is meant to be read and then put into my personal collection. The disconnect between me thinking a near mint X-Men 101 is worth a high price because it's the first Phoenix, but a 1 in 100 variant of anything is worth just a bit more than normal uh, shows that people collecting are not uniform. I would agree with that. Uh, If the money in the variant market was gone, it would have an effect on comics, but I don't think the volume of variants is long-term sustainable. And that's a great point. Uh, you know, I, I like how he puts that, you know, while, while not a crash, uh, we can see a fender bender happening. Yeah. And I think that's probably, for me, in my opinion, that's kind of what we would see when this whole variant thing um, and it would be a, a fender bender. I don't think that that's going to cause a crash. So, do you, I mean, I understand what he's saying. Obviously, he's looking at a solid book with a solid foundation the first appearance of dark phoenix or something sure, like that sure. compared to a hey this is a one in 100 incentive variant type mm-hmm. thing so if that goes away the one in 100 type thing or the one in 10 or 24 whatever you want to call it, that, that variant if that no longer becomes a big deal is that enough to cause a crash i don't think so i, I really don't i because that, that's first hand books that's like when they come out you know that's that's the direct to sale books right there we're not talking about the books that have been out for 20 or 30 years, mm-hmm. like the X-Men, the one that he brought in as an example. We're talking about next week's books, the 1 in 10, the 1 in 20. If that is gone, mm-hmm. what do the publishers do? Because they're making some money on that. Sure they are. And so, I mean, but, but let's just look at what we're talking about here. I mean, you know, again, yeah, you have uh, these var- these incentive variants where they co- the comic shop has to buy a certain number in order to get that, that book. Do you see, we, we, we go to a couple LCSs. Let's just say you get a 1 in 100 book. Do you see any of our LCSs buying 100 books of something and, and have that one on sale? Well, definitely not one of them. Well, definitely not one of them. But I would say the majority, we have a lot of comic shops out here. Yeah. And I would say the majority of them are not ones that are buying hundreds of books to get that one variant. Yeah. Right? There's about maybe 10 or 15 large stores in the United States that are doing that type of thing. And they, you know, they... they we do have a couple here in Portland that I know do mm-hmm. that. Because I've, I've actually gotten their collection of books, mm-hmm. you know. And, and uh, I've asked myself, why do they buy... Why is there 50 copies of uh, <laughs> this number five Avengers? You know, mm-hmm. why would anyone buy 50 copies of that? And I go and I look, and sure enough, there was a one in 50 incentive. And that's the only reason they bought it. Right, right. And then they have 40 copies available. So I do, I do know a couple shops that do that. And mm-hmm. I've actually, it has been to my benefit, to be honest with you, because they dump them. Sure, type sure. Thing. But, uh, I, you know, the, the one in the hundreds, yeah, the, that's a bigger number yes. when you say that. The, for the most time, when you get an incentive, it's around one in ten or one in twenty-five. Exactly. That's a little bit more doable for a lot of shops. Sure, but uh, I do think that if that fades away, then there, there's a good possibility that the publishers are going to be pretty pissed off. You know, because they they don't care. I say that I don't really know, but I just Marvel or DC. 
they sell two diamond and diamond goes to the store type thing. Whether the store sells those books or not, mm-hmm. those guys already got their money. Right. Type thing. So whether the, the store has 40 copies of an Avengers 5 still sitting there on the shelf, which they do, it I don't think it really matters too much to Marvel or Diamond for that matter because they already got their money. The stores already had to buy them. It's the stores who kind of suffer. The reason they're buying that many comics is to get that variant. If they don't have that aspect, they don't care about that variant, they don't want it, then they're not buying that many comics. Mm-hmm. And that directly affects Marvel and DC. If that bubble bursts, that could cause a ripple effect. Because, for one, we would probably see a true sales figures for books. Mm-hmm. Not inflated sales figures because they bought so many to get that one cover. Because the total sales, what we see now, is all the books bought. Okay, That doesn't mean they were sold. It just means the ones that were ordered for the comic shops. Not sell-through type thing. There's a big difference between that. Sure. So... If the variant thing does go away, it does make me a little bit worried because I think I think it's a combination of everything that makes the market go right sure. now. So that's kind of my take on that one. Yeah, you know, and 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 it, you know, when it comes to something like this, it's it's more of a combination of things now than any direct thing. So I mean, Marvel and DC and Image, when they create these variants, they're 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 not going to lose money if that goes away because it's the comic shops that are ordering in advance for this stuff, so they know what they're going to print. Yeah. And so, but if the comic shops start going down, of course, that means less print. You got less comic shops, you got less books sold. And so there is a ripple effect. I would completely agree with that. Uh, but as far as it, you know, being this bubble that's going to burst, I don't think that it's going to be something that is going to be as detrimental as people are pinpointing that one thing for. Yeah. So that's all I'm trying to say. Yeah. We always have a lot of comparison between the variants and the uh, gimmick covers from the 90s. A lot of people bring that up. Absolutely. I uh, like the die cut, the, the shiny. I love the shiny sure. stuff, man. I don't right. know why they give us such I a like hard shiny covers. <laughs> 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 All right. Uh, this next one I got, this is from John's Comics with Kids. John, thank you so much. He's been a long time uh, viewer of the channel. He's got a great channel, and he's very close to 1,000 subscribers. Wow. So if you're watching this and you're not checking out John's Comics with Kids, go ahead and do so. It's got a great channel and subscribe to it because he's, he's a good dude. So. That's awesome. Uh, John, he says, love the question, Bueller. Oh, thanks, John. <laughs> uh, <laughs> you always have compelling discussions. On the topic of Crash, I'd say no for many, many reasons, but the chief one is Disney. Okay, that's pretty good. What is making this bubble or boom happen is the quality and proliferation of films, especially Marvel films. Disney isn't going to let that flounder or fail. They will continue to push for bigger budgets and higher quality films from that division. Therefore, those films will continue to drive the high level of interest in key books. Thanks for the topic. And Bob, I think you're great, but don't tell Sam. (laughs) There you go. That's awesome. John, you're my new favorite person. (laughs) John's a good dude. (laughs) Yeah, he is. (laughs) Sorry, Sam. (laughs) We love you, Sam. Uh, that's a, you know that, that, that is a great comment, and you know that kind of ties back into our discussion we had last week. You know, uh, you know, does Hollywood have a good or bad effect on mm-hmm. on the market? And um, you know, I do think that the the films do have a good effect on it. It does bring older readers, sometimes new readers, uh, to the industry. Um, but I don't think Disney or Warner Brothers or any of these you know larger companies that own our our our, our comic properties. Uh, are too worried about the actual publishing part of the industry. And, and that's that's the part that I'm most worried about. Yeah. That's the part where I believe that we need to watch out yeah. for. So this is a great comment. Um, the one thing he says here, and I, I like this, because he doesn't reference new books or newer readers. Mm-hmm. He's, he's referencing key books and older books, sure. the secondary market type thing, mm-hmm. and what the movies do to drive that market. Mm-hmm. Because I think we've, we've discussed it enough to, to kind of notice that uh, uh, the current movies or TV shows don't really attract too many newer, quote, newer people into the comic book industry type thing. Yeah. Uh, they do a little bit, but not as much as you would think they would do. Exactly. Um, like I said, it's more character-based. People get more familiar with the character. They go buy a t-shirt or something like that. Not necessarily jumping on the bag wagon and going and buying Black Panther number one. Right. It's just, it just didn't happen. I mean, it was like the number one Marvel movie of that year. Sales did not go through the roof of, of Black Panther, nope. the ongoing series type thing. Mm-hmm. It just doesn't happen. 
But he talked about the the keys that are referenced in the movie, like the let's say the Red Guardian, which is a character that's going to be in the new Black Widow movie. Yeah, that's driving the sale of those books as people find out about that. That is a nice thing to have. That does help the comic book industry, but it only helps for the most part the secondary industry. That's right. So Marvel and DC don't really see any revenue from that. You know, they only see the revenue from new purchased books. Sure. Hopefully that sparks more interest, and maybe you know, oh, the Red Guardian is going to be in there, so I'm going to go get a, go get the first appearance, and maybe Marvel will make a Red Guardian comic. I don't right, know. Right, you know, right. so they've done other things or whatnot. But I, I think the I like the fact that the movies do kind of drive within the comic book community. I think within current collectors, they drive up those keys that have already been out for years and years type thing. Absolutely. And it sparks interest and it makes us want to go digging for those sure. that we probably just passed by not too long ago. So I like the effect that that has. And I think a strong secondary market will keep the industry going type thing. At least I hope so. Oh, for sure. For sure. I mean, you know, a secondary, you, you can't discount the effect a secondary market can have. Uh, let's just take vinyl, for instance. That was a secondary market for a number of years because they weren't, you know, selling yeah. things on vinyl anymore. So they, they were selling them in the background. Now it's made a resurgence. Uh, now everybody's going out and buying vinyl. They're actually creating record players again. And so you can't discount the secondary market. I know... I know that that's kind of a different thing because, it, you know, you can create something yeah. for it. But at the same time, you know, that secondary market is very important. Collectors really get into that stuff. And, yeah, the movies do drive up the yeah. prices on these things. Very much so. Okay, I think I'm reading the next one as well. This one is from Mr. Kim. Mr. Kim. Mr. Kim. It says, Comic Crash, yes, guaranteed. Mm. That's always... No, there's more to it. So. <laughs> uh, reasons. Comics are only valuable as long as there are buyers. Once the buyers are gone, there is no one behind us to absorb all the material. The question is not if, but when. Also, the term crash is misleading. It won't be a sudden drop with sparks. It will be a steady decline as baby boomers continue to die off. This is a long comment, so i got to go to the second page. Mm-hmm. <laughs> But I think the question is referring to short term. Again, yes, if you believe in the economic cycle, Trump has propped up the stock market by deregulating, but it can't last. Once he's gone, expect the bottom to drop, unless you believe that people are spending more all of the sudden because of Trump. Housing has been hot, and comics have had a huge run since 2012. Everything can't keep being hot when wages have been flat for the past 30 to 40 years logic dictates that the economy has to give at some point and we are already long overdue the next crash won't be comic specific but an overall economic downturn this doesn't mean that comic values will necessarily drop those who can hold their books will try but expect the market to at least flatline as activity slows to a grinding hole in the same way it did back in 2007 to 2011, but maybe not as bad since the CGC market has matured somewhat. Hmm. Okay, so Mr. Kim, he's talking about pretty much just an economic crash down the board, right. and as far as having disposable income not available. Right. Um, that's a great point, and we could see that. I don't think it matters on who's an office or what now. I mean, it no. just happens in cycles type right, thing. Right, And it's unfortunate that it does. But one thing that comics are, they're not extremely expensive. Mm-mm. And there's a cheap form of uh, entertainment. Sure. Uh, I'll give you an example when I say this. When we were in our economic crisis, whatever you want to call it, recession or whatever they refer to it, mm-hmm. during 2000. 7 to 2011 the uh, movie industry did very well yes it did movie prices and people went to the movies a lot because it was a very inexpensive form of entertainment escape escape exactly for what's going on um, comics are kind of in that same ballpark type thing now this is just my opinion and this might not hold true but if there is some sort of a crisis going on the word escape to get away from that that's exactly how I feel about books type thing. Sure. There's a lot of crap going on. You know, I want to go and 
buy some 50 cent books and just kind of read, just forget about it type thing. Right. So even though a downturn in the economy probably would make it uh, go down a little bit as far as the industry, it's cheap enough to get that escape from what's going on in the outside world. Absolutely. I would agree with that. But this brings up the actual point that I'm most concerned for. Uh, there is an economic downturn coming. If you look at the um, semiconductor uh, industry and you look at the transportation industry, those are usually your best indicators of what's going on. We're getting I, deep here, folks. We are. And We're I'm going to deep. I'm going to get deep right now because I work in the <laughs> transportation industry and our company has already started making cuts because they see the turn coming. They see orders already diminishing because we build the order and it's six months out. And so, so we're preparing for an economic downturn, and we've been through a few of them, so we know what's going on. And this is this is the issue. Now, just recently, Rob Liefeld came out with a comment oh, here that we a go. lot of people were very upset over. And what did he say? He said, DC is dead. Remember when he said that? A lot of people were very upset. I was upset. I'm like, what are you talking about? Oh, you know, he must, you know, he, he just on one of his rants again. But... If you look at the research and you look at what's going on with DC, this is the bigger concern. Warner Brothers is who owns DC. Warner Brothers is a multi-billion dollar company, right? And the comic book market itself is only worth about $2 billion. Very little. When you think about the fact that DC only owns 23% of that market, that's less than $2 billion yeah. that they own. For a multi-billion dollar company, we saw last year at San Diego Comic-Con that DC, who normally has a presence there, was relegated to the back of the room. Warner Brothers' uh, main, uh, their, their CEO, in announcing all of their stuff fiscally, didn't even mention their publishing company, DC yeah. Comics, in anything. This is a concern. Because if DC, they go ahead and, and liquidate it, right, which they could do, Think about that. What would happen to Diamond? Yeah, that, right? uh, that's that's the. When you talk about Diamond, that's the one thing I worry about. I don't worry about the. I don't worry about them liquidating. I don't. I don't really. I, either, I, I, I worry. I worry about say. Marvel and DC just decide, or whoever. Let's, let's just say DC, since that's what we're talking about. DC decides. You know what? We have our DC Universe app. Let's just put all our books on digital. Digital, type thing. exactly. And uh, they're still available. They're still being made, you know. Mm -hmm. But that cuts out Diamond. Okay? Right. Diamond is is has no access to DC content, okay? Because DC or, or whoever is going directly to digital, it cuts out Diamond completely. Can Diamond survive being the only distributor that's out there without DC, without one of the big publishers no longer putting out physical copies of the book? And that's the biggest concern because from what we know... Diamond is barely keeping afloat. Yeah, and so uh, you know something like that happening would directly affect the market. Yeah. Would directly affect what we would consider a crash, and that's something to be very concerned yeah. about. It always has worried me that we only have one distributor. Yes, uh, Diamond has kind of been the one for forever, almost type mm -hmm. thing, and really without them, the whole system has to go through a big change. Yeah, type thing, and how long would that take to put a change or put something into place? take over from what they've been doing type thing and if dc was gone or dc i don't want to say gone because i don't think that's going to happen it's just superman is always going to be there batman is always going to be there in some shape or form um but if they do decide to go digital what happens to the distributor what happens to diamond is that a big enough chunk to say man then we're not going to make it type thing right and if it's 25 percent of your market that's a big piece that is a big piece and and so it, Forgive me if I'm wrong, but the smaller distributors, yeah. they don't have the volume to be able to take care of what we need. Yeah, very much so. Bob, everybody. <laughs> happy happy time, Bob. Yeah, here. you know what? I don't mean to be the bearer of bad news, but okay. that's what I'm in concern is. Okay, Bob, you got the <laughs> next comment. Sure thing. That's what comes from Two Brothers Comics. Oh. Thank you, Two Brothers. Uh, he says, not a chance. Uh, markets then, I think he's talking about the 90s, were flooded and people were buying everything based on a spec purchasing market that had never been seen before. With the ability to research and technology involved now, it would be difficult for something similar to happen. Now with the funding 
uh, coming from these studios purchasing IP or creating movies with their own IP and the additional popularity of comics created from these IPs, it will only improve the market. In other words, Marvel won't fall like they did, like they almost did in the 90s, now being backed by Disney. Digital comics slash piracy may be a slow drain, uh, but it won't cause a bust. Seems to be the only industry where 99% prefer paper, and now we also have a big upst uptick in collected editions being sold and collected, like Omnibus, Absolute, etc. Uh, bottom line is the boom isn't as big as it was in the 90s, and the market isn't solely based on the big two, with all the increase in indie popularity and IP movie slash TV production. Love the topic. Could chat about it for days. Nick. Uh, and so you know, th this comment, there's like a thread on this one. Yeah. And there's people talk. <laughs> I mean, there's like 12 or 13 responses to this so that people are kind of going back and forth so this is just part of it so if you guys want to go see the whole thread um, it goes on for a while um, he brings up a couple of good points he does mention the big two uh, but in the 90s we did see image you know kind of come out there and actually for a period of time image was right behind Marvel ahead of DC and they contributed just as much to the let's say crash a big part of it was because of uh, the flood of image books that came in the door. So there was more than just Marvel and DC that caused that crash in the 90s. Um, now we have so many more publishers. So many indie publishers. Mm -hmm. And I've said this many times. Um, he referred to the spec market. Uh, he referred to some other things. I think it's a combination of everything that has to have a healthy market. I believe that there is... You have to have that speculation market. Yeah. That has to be there. The speculator, whether you like a speculator or not, and you, man, I hate the guys that buy all the books. It has to be there. The people who like the stories, they have to be there. The people that get the trades have to be there. They all have to be there. It's all pieces of the puzzle. If you take one piece out, it doesn't work. Whether you agree with the people that are buying those books or their reasons for buying those books, it's a necessity. Yeah. They have, it doesn't work if they're not there. Whether you like it or not, they all, we all play a part in this for this market to continue. Yeah, absolutely. I, I would agree. And, and so, you know, that really, what's going to help, you know, a, a crash or the prevention of a crash, it's going to be us. Yeah. It's going to be the actual collectors that are out there. Uh, you know, take a comic book, folks, and hand it to your friend. Hey, check this out. Uh, you know, start to uh, turn people on to the amazing medium that we have because we don't want to see this go away. And you're right. It is all part of a, of a whole. There are multiple pieces that go into it, and all of it, stay, all of it stays up by all of it being healthy. Yeah. And the, the biggest piece for us to be able to keep our, uh, you know, our hobby going is to bring in new, fresh readers into the market. Uh, because if without that, it slowly yeah. dies off, and so I, and speculators and speculators, and speculators as well. As well. I, and and you know, if as long as the movies and the books go hand in hand, and as long as they keep putting out good content, yeah. you're always going to have speculation, and that's healthy. Yeah. Uh, the only thing I would say about speculators, um, educate yourself. Absolutely, is the best thing you you can do. Use the material that's available to you. Um, do your research if you're looking to spend some money. You know, if you're just dabbling in it and make 20 bucks here and there it's really no big deal but if you're going out and making big purchases do your research because there's probably better things you can be spending your money on you know I've had a lot of people say to me oh I how much I've asked how much you spent for that book about ten thousand dollars <laughs> oh my god <laughs> uh, to me I, I mean I have like I said before I struggle paying you know 40 bucks for a book type right, thing right but you know what to, to each their own, to each and, their own. Uh, and it's all relative it, exactly and like I said it it takes us all to make this work. If Absolutely. one goes away, it all falls down. For sure. Whether you like it or not, that's just kind of the world that we live in. So There you go. We're tied together, folks. There you go. <laughs> um, but that was all the comments that we have for that question. And uh, great conversation. We'll, we'll re revisit this again at some point. We'll actually revisit all of our questions at some point because the simple fact that we have so many comments, it's a different discussion every time. Absolutely. You know, so it's, it's kind of nice. But that being said... Next week's question, the sneak peek, and this will be on the preview video this Wednesday. The question we are going to ask, and we are going to have the uh, the great debate. Um, <laughs> what is a true first appearance? Oh. This is a great one. 
you know, the whole the Hulk 180, 181. We're going to have that uh, question on there. So make sure you watch uh, the preview video on Wednesday that comes, uh, comes out then. The question will be, what is a true first appearance? And uh, we will talk about that next week on the coffee video. This one, people get pissed. Yeah, I know, I know. <laughs> so, <laughs> I'm looking forward to talking about this one. So it obviously, for the most part, always goes back to the Incredible Hulk 180, 181. That's for the sure. one that people talk about most. So, for uh, sure. It should be a lot of fun. It will be. But anyway, let's go ahead and do our final five, and then I will tell you my horrible comic book sh shop story after that. So, Bob, go ahead and go first, my friend. Okay, so uh, for my uh, final five, I figure I'd give Deathstroke some love. Nice. Since he got beat down really quick this week. I hate when that happens <laughs> since he's such a great villain. Uh, but this is uh, Deathstroke number one from the uh, Rebirth, DC Rebirth, um, Universe Rebirth. And then uh, we got issue number two. I love that cover. Then we got issue number eight. We got Superman socking Deathstroke there. Nice. And you then, think that would be it. The fight's over, right? Right, exactly. Yeah. And then uh, we got Year of the Villain. This is a David Finch cover. Nice. Like that one. And then uh, our good friend, Mr. Matina, uh, for the uh, DC series, he put out a version of Deathstroke there. And so there's my final five. Very cool. Okay, I got my final five. And speaking of Deathstroke, this is Batman 86. This is a new James Tinian one that came out. I really like that book. We, we enjoyed that book. Uh, Pandemica, number three. This was actually one of my favorite books. A little controversial. Uh, full warning, it deals with some pretty sensitive subject matters. Um, these next ones my buddy got for me. Hmm. Uh, this is Star, number one. Brand new series. Look at that. J. Very Scott cool. Campbell. J. Scott Campbell. And my buddy who got me these books really loves the ladies. And you got Excalibur number five. This is the uh, Dark Phoenix 40th anniversary one. And then this one right here, Symbiote Spider-Man number one, the variant edition of Clayton Crane. This is limited to uh, 1,500. This is number 533. Look at that goodness right there. My buddy who likes the ladies on the covers also got this as well that guy right there uh but that's my final five thank you sir so much absolutely my friend hopefully you guys like those but uh we're gonna move to my horrible comic shop story real quick let's do it and because people ask me about this so um here we go so i have reference material and uh i'm not going to say the shop's name because i still go there and i actually consider the guy there somewhat of a friend mm -hmm. type thing um but uh this is basically what happened. On my pull list, in my pull box, I have Doomsday Clock. And this was, you know, about a year ago. And it was issue number seven. And I go in uh, on the afternoon when the books came in. It's new comic book day. And I go to see what's in my box. And I grab my box, and there's like three or four books. And the Doomsday Clock cover is this one, which is the lantern with the bug on it. And that's the one that's in my box, Okay. And I say, uh, oh, do you have the variant cover? And he uh, tends to argue with me sometimes when I ask for stuff like that. He's like, why would you want that cover? It's, it's, this one's better. And I go, no, I, I kind of like the other one. Mm -hmm. Because the other one is this one right here, which is, has uh, the Joker and Warshack on the front. This is the, the B cover or whatnot. Okay? So that's the one I wanted. And I said, that's a better cover. He's like, well, I might have it on the shelf over there. So I go over and I see it. It's sitting on the shelf. He's got one left on the shelf. So I grab it and I said, hey, can I get this one instead? He's like, yeah, that's fine. He goes, I still like the other one. He, he was arguing with me about what I like. <laughs> that's the, you know, that's who he is. Um, so I go, do me a favor, I'll put it in my box. I'll come back later today and I'll, I'll pick it up. And uh, I told him, I said, you know, this is a better cover or something like that. As I'm sitting there waiting. Uh, or just kind of talking to him another customer comes in to get their box and the customer comes he in his box is the other customer he's got doomsday clock and he has this book in there the customer says he goes hey do you have the variant and I look at the John I go I told you man it's the better cover and uh, uh, the comic shop owner says oh uh, no I don't have anybody I could probably find you one the comic shop owner reaches into my box and pulls out my copy of this 
and he gives it to the other guy. I thought it was a joke. I literally thought it was a joke because I was just leaving. And then I left, and I came back a couple hours later, and when I get there, it wasn't a joke. He took my copy out of my box, sold it to the guy, and then put this copy back into my box. Wow. And uh, he had that for sale. He goes, he goes, no, I wasn't joking. I sold it to the other guy. And I was so upset. And he's like, oh, don't worry, don't worry. I'll take care of you. He never did. He never got it back. I had to go somewhere else and get this one type thing. And this one I just found just recently for 50 cents, by the way. <laughs> but uh, that was the comic shop story. Um, I've never had... I told you, you, you said you'd never go back there again if, if he did that to you. <laughs> if he did that to me, I would never go back there again yeah. because that's not him taking care of his customer. Well, he took care of the other guy. Oh, well, yeah, sure. But I mean, you know, I, I don't care about the other guy. <laughs> you know? Wow, everybody. <laughs> you know, when I'm making my comic purchase and, you know, from the from the guy and I told him what he want, if he takes away from me to give to somebody else, what is that? I don't know. That's a horrible story. Yeah. Uh, you know, I remember when you told me about it, and I was like, I couldn't believe it because I go to that shop too. That's his shop. You know, <laughs> that, that, that's my LCS, and it's just like, oh my gosh. Yeah. But you know, you, you know, in all honesty, you know, he he is a good guy. Uh, it just, I mean, whatever his lapse was in that yeah. particular area was a foul. <laughs> I got a couple other ones. That I'll, share, I'll share, maybe I'll share another one next week. Uh, all right. But uh, anyway, I, I, the good news is I eventually got the book I wanted. Yeah. The other customer got the book he wanted because it was mine. It took it out of my box. Yeah, yeah. But uh, anyway. So it's, just just want to make sure. Yeah, it's a minor thing. No big deal. Have you recovered? Yeah, I recovered. Right. I'm, I'm <laughs> yeah. But uh, I, I just wanted to share that story. People asked about it, but uh, there you go. Um, you know what? That's all we have for this week. Bob, why don't you tell them a little bit about your channel before we go? Sure thing. Thank you. So my channel is Everything Comics. I also do a, a coffee and um, a review video. Uh, which comes out on Saturdays. And uh, yesterday I had uh, Bueller as a guest on the show, and, and that was an awesome time before we went to the image signing. Uh, I also have a new show coming out uh, this week. It's good, it basically a countdown video, uh, counting down the days until Washington State SummerCon 2020. It's going to be an amazing event, and I'm kind of excited about putting this, this, this new video out. So there you have it, folks. Tune in and give a like and subscribe. I appreciate your help. Awesome. Yeah, I'll put his link down below so you can check out Bob's channel. He's on his way to 400 subscribers. It's going to happen sooner than later. I think that's pretty cool. Once again, I want to say thank you to the my very first Patreon member who <laughs> signed up without even any knowledge that I had a Patreon. That I didn't awesome. tell anybody. Uh, Mike Rogers, thank you so much. I appreciate that, my friend. Uh, there is some Bueller boxes for sale right now if you guys want any. And uh, you know what? That's about it. I want to say thank you so much for watching. We'll have more stuff coming out this week. Don't forget to like and subscribe. You know what to do. I'll see you next time, and Bob will see you next time.